your name the mountains shake and crumble at your name the oceans roar will bow the earth will rejoice your people cry out Lord of all the earth will shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh we love to shout your name oh Lord The morning breaks in glory At your name Creation sings your story At your name Angels will bow The earth will people cry out Lord of all the earth will shout your name shout your name filling up the skies with endless praise endless praise Yahweh Yahweh we love to shout your name oh Lord there is no one like our God Praise you, praise you. There's no one like our God. We will sing, we will sing. There is no one like our God. We will praise you, praise you. Jesus, you are God. We will sing. Lord of all the earth, will shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, O oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, will shout your name, shout your name. Filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name, oh Lord. Lord of all the earth, we'll shout your name, shout your name, filling up the skies with endless praise, endless praise. Yahweh, Yahweh, we love to shout your name. Jesus be my 
It's uh, an honor and a pleasure to be able to um, stand up here and, and present uh, what God has uh, laid upon my heart to share with all of you. Um, I know that um, it, it doesn't matter how many times um, we do it. I imagine the, even the pastor um, tends to get nervous and, you know, we, uh, or at least I um, was okay up until, you know, he started praying and then my heart starts racing. But, you know, I thank God that it's not me that, um, that does this, but him through me. And I, I trust in him that he is the one that's going to speak today. So uh, with that being said, uh, if you want to start making your way to Romans 12, um, today um, we will be, the message is, is on Romans 12 or, or, or focused on Romans 12. But <clears throat> before we, we get into it, um, there's 11 chapters before that that, that we have to understand um, before we dive into Romans 12. So um, a big part of the, the message is kind of an overview or just like a, a, a skimming on, on Romans chapter 1 through 11. Um, for the last few months, I've been going over Romans, and um, I couldn't get past chapter 9 or 10. I just kept starting over and over again, and I couldn't understand why. Um, and so uh, about a month ago when the pastor uh, asked me if I could cover this, when, um, yeah, this Wednesday, I said, sure. Um, and then I started praying about what it is that God wanted me to share with y'all. And um, as I was praying, 
uh, I realized that I had was I was able to finally make it to Romans 12, um, you know, past that point of chapter 10, I think it was where I kept stopping. Um, and it, you know, it, it, I felt God laying it upon my heart to just share uh, that with y'all um, about Romans 12. Um, but, you know, he wanted me to make sure that I also went over 1 through 11 uh, because, it's, like I said, it's very important that we understand what those chapters say. Uh, in a nutshell, Romans 1 through 11 talk about what God, God has done for us. And then in chapters 12 forward, it's what we must do uh, because or, 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 you know, in, in light of what he has done for us. So if we understand Romans 1 through 11, then it will almost be a natural thing for us to be able to walk out our faith as Paul teaches us in uh, chapter 12 and forward. So um, let's pray um, before we dive in. Father, we come before you. Uh, giving you honor and glory. We thank you, Father God, for another opportunity that you've given us to gather here to sing praises um, and worship you, God. Um, as we get ready to dive into your word, I pray that it is you that's speaking to us. I move out of the way and I allow you to just take full control of my mind, my heart, my whole body, my whole being, that you speak to us, Lord, um, and that if there's anybody here who doesn't know you, Lord, I pray that the gospel is, is made clear to them, Lord, that they may uh, be able to understand what you have done for us. And uh, I pray that you, Holy Spirit, um, bring them to the point of repentance and that they may be saved, um, knowing that it is only through Jesus Christ that we are saved. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> Romans chapter 12, um, one thing that... that, that that's good to know is it's Paul's longest and most detailed presentation of the gospel. Um, you know, I, I, as I was uh, going over it and realizing that, you know, how detailed and extensive Paul gets in this letter uh, regarding the gospel, uh, I, uh, you know, I was thinking, you know, the different types of uh, teachers that we have um, in this church alone. Um, you know, we have... Uh, Paul wrote letters like Romans uh, and like Philemon. And then you have letters uh, like um, Galatians and Ephesians. Um, all of them preach the gospel in one way or another. But, you know, Romans is a lot detailed. It goes into a lot of explaining. And that's, that's how I tend to be. If you ask my wife, she'll tell you that, you know, if I ask him a question, he's going to go on this... <laughs> on this long explanation about the answer. And the reason why I do that is because I want to make sure that I'm, I come clear and that I don't leave no, no gray areas on my answer. Um, you know, and, and so I, I kind of relate to that. Whereas I see, uh, like Pastor Albert's more of an Ephesians and Galatians where it's, you know, shorter, but it's still the gospel and it's clear. You know, it still doesn't leave any, anything out, but, you know, it's... it's Package is a lot smaller, and then you got other teachers that just Philemon, that oh, just you know, straight to the point. But regardless, the word of God is still being preached, right? And that's what's important. So I, 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 I thought that was interesting. Um, it was written to a church that was allowing itself to be divided by cultural differences, um, Jews and Gentiles. So this this church in Rome was was made up of both Jews and Gentiles, and well, you know, different cultures. Um, and so with, with being different cultures, there comes problems, you know, uh, where, you know, I think it'll happen anywhere. Um, the, the, the different type of people that you have in the church, our, our, our uh, human side tends to kind of want to group up with the people that are like-minded or that look like us or dress like us or from the same background as us. But, um, you know, uh, in, in Christ, you know, th there's none of that. We are all one in Christ. We are all the same. So we're no longer uh, divided by any of that. But unfortunately, um, this, this was a problem that was happening not only in Rome. Um, you know, Sunday series, um, we're, we're going through the book of uh, Colossians, the letter of Colossians. And 
there we, we are seeing the different cultures and their teachings, cre teachings creeping into the church, trying to cause confusion and division. So this wasn't nothing exclusive to Rome. It happened in a lot of the other churches, and Paul had to address it when he wrote the letters. Um, Wednesday series um, on Leviticus, uh, it's interesting because we're seeing the cultural restrictions that God gave the Jews so that they would be set apart from the cultures around them. So they had that in them that they had to be different from everybody else. But when they, when they converted to Christianity, they kind of, it was kind of hard for them to, to leave that behind. So they were kind of bringing it with them and, you know, still causing that division, still probably wanting to sit on the side where the Jews would sit as opposed to the Gentiles, maybe at their tables, uh, at their fellowships. They wanted to kind of, hey, well, this, this table is, you know, for, for the Jews. Uh, the Gentiles sit over there. And whatever, you know, you can just imagine. But Paul wanted to make sure to address that. And so um, I think in our culture, in our churches nowadays, I think we can fall into the same thing if we're not careful. Um, I know that pastor's been, uh, he, he's mentioned it a few times that he doesn't like that cliquish type of uh, behavior in our church because it tends to cause division. And when there's division, then comes problems. I think we are all united because of Christ, and that's something that we should just focus on at, at all times, right? Um, so bro, uh, uh, Paul starts off by saying in, in chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. So he made it clear from the very beginning that he wasn't ashamed of the gospel. He made it clear that it was about faith and not about works, which the Jews ended up falling into the belief that it was about their works that was saving them. Um, you know, and he wanted to make that clear. And I think that with that statement right off the top, he made it clear. And as he said, it, it reveals the righteousness of God because it tells us that we are sinners, that we are all sinners and none is righteous. No, not one. And so that, you know, that's bad news. But the good news is that Jesus came to die on the cross for my sins, for your sins, for everybody's sins. Those who would believe in him shall not perish, but, but have everlasting life. The good news, right? So I, it's very important that we know what the bad news is for us to be able to appreciate what the good news is. <clears throat> so again, as I said... Um, the first 11 chapters is what God has done for us, um, what we call doctrine. <clears throat> in, verse, in chapters 1 through 4, we see the righteousness of God revealed. Uh, in chapter 3, verses 21 through 26, it says, But now the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all who believe. For there is no difference, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God set forth as a propitiation for, by His blood through faith to demonstrate His righteousness, because in His forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed to demonstrate at the present time His righteousness, that He might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then he continues on in chapters 5 through 8 to talk about a new, a new humanity revealed. A new humanity. So it's no longer about Jews and Gentiles. It's no longer about uh, what race you are. It is about you're either saved or you're not saved. You're either, uh, you're either a Christian or you're not. <clears throat> in chapter 5, 18 through 19, he says, Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation. Even so, through one man's righteous act, the free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience many will be made righteous. And here it's talking about the first Adam and the second Adam, who is Jesus Christ. First Adam, by his disobedience, we all became sinners. Second Adam, Jesus, 
by the act on the cross, the, the, his death on the cross, we are all made righteous, those of us who believe in him. Chapter 6, 16 and 18, he says, Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey? You are that one slave whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or of obedience leading to righteousness. But God be thanked that through, I'm sorry, but God be thanked that though you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered. And having been set free from sin, you became slaves of righteousness. You see, we're all slaves. Whose slave are you? Uh, uh, you know, we were, all of us at one point were slaves to sin. And if we accept that free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ, then we're no longer slaves to sin, but slaves to righteousness, slaves to God. Um, I think it was this, this past Sunday that pastor talked and said something to the effect of, uh, we, were, um, we were dead in sin, now we're dead to sin. It's talking about the same thing. When we were dead in sin, we were slaves to sin. Now that we're dead to sin, we are no longer slaves to sin. We've been freed from that, and now we're slaves of God, of righteousness. In verses 20 and 20 through 23 of that same chapter, he says, For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. What fruit did you have then in the things of which you are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now having been set free from sin and having become slaves of God, you have your fruit to holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Then he goes on to, to say in chapter 7 verses 15 through 20. For I do not understand. Here he, he, here's where it gets somewhat complicated. Um, and I can relate to that. Um, Paul starts explaining the battle within himself, the, 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 the old or, or, or the flesh, you know, and, and the spirit, you know, and, and, and I think we can all relate to that to some extent. I know I can. Um, you know, it, it's a battle that we feel like uh, if we're not, if we don't understand it, we feel like maybe what's wrong with me? Am I not doing the right thing or is it... It can bring you to doubt if, if you let it start questioning your salvation. Maybe perhaps you really aren't saved. Perhaps you didn't even say that prayer from all, you know, with all your heart. And then you start questioning it. Like, because why am I having these feelings? Or why is this battle continuously? You know, I want to do good, but I keep doing bad. And Paul had that same problem. He goes on to say, for I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law, that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is, in my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And, and when I was reading that, I was like, you know, I, I can totally relate to it. It's like, you know, so it's, it's encouraging because, you know, we're, we're so used to reading uh, Paul's letters. And, and you know, we, we find this man uh, full of faith from the very beginning, from his conversion uh, when when uh, a few weeks ago we covered it in the men's Bible study. And it's just, it's amazing how immediately Paul goes from one side of the spectrum to the other, where he is an enemy of the gospel to, you know, one that is proclaiming it almost like loudest than anybody else. He's, he's working, uh, you know, and walking out his salvation and, 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 uh, you know, walking out his faith in a, in a way that totally blows my mind. So, you know, this man of faith has this, this battle within him. So I feel encouragement that, okay, if Paul had this battle, then I'm not so bad. You know, because I'm not the only one who faces this. <clears throat> Verses 21 through 25, he says, So I find it to be a law that when I do the right, when, when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in my inner being. 
But I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, I myself serve the law of God with my mind, but my, with my flesh I serve the law of sin. So, again, um, we, if, if somebody said, if you stop Romans at chapter 7, it's, it's very depressing. It's almost like, okay, you know, yeah, like there's no hope. You know, it's like, yeah, God did all this. And, and then pointing out, you know, even those that, that are trying to follow God, that are trying to do good, struggle. And it's almost like, you know, oh, wretched man that I am, you know. And, and, and if you were to stop just there, it'd be very depressing. But Romans 8 follows. And for those of you who are familiar, Romans 8 is a chapter that kind of up, uplifts your spirit. Because now we're told how um, we're not condemned in sin. My, my, yeah, let's read Romans 8. I, I, <laughs> I was going to um, just talk about it, but I think that reading it is, is um, makes it a whole lot more clear. And I don't have to speak on it and just let the Bible speak for itself. So after Paul said, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? He goes on to say, There is therefore now no condemnation than those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, He condemned sin in the flesh, that the righteousness requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh set their mind, minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is an enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. But you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anybody does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. And if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. But the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. Verse 18, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly awaits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope, because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance." Verse 26, likewise, the spirit also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray for as we ought. 
But the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he who searches the hearts knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. Verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died, and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now, if you understand everything that is said in chapter 8, then, of course, your spirit is, is lifted up. You, you're no longer uh, condemned. You know, and everything that Paul wrote right there is, is uplifting for us because we are no longer under the bondage of sin and we are no longer judged for our sins because Christ paid it all. So that's, that's the reason why I wanted to make sure to read that chapter completely. For those of us who, who perhaps have heard some of the verses, I know uh, I've heard some of the verses, but... In context, it, it makes a lot more sense why we can say that we are more than conquerors. Why we can say that all things work together for good. <clears throat> now, in, in chapters 9 through 11, we see God's promises to Israel fulfilled. Some that um, are still to come. In, ch in chapter 9, verses 1 through 5, he says, I tell the truth in Christ, I am not lying. My conscience also bearing, my, bearing me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and continual grief in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed from, the, from Christ for my brethren, my countrymen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom pertain the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the service of God, and the promises of whom are the fathers and from whom, according to the flesh, Christ came who is over all, the eternally blessed God. Amen. So Paul goes into talking about, look, yeah, the Gentiles are sinners. The Jews are sinners. Jews, although they were elected and they're God's people, <clears throat> have rejected Christ. And in that rejection, then they're also lost. And Paul starts off this, this, this chapter by saying that he would be willing to be accursed from Christ for the salvation of his people. That's how much he loved his people. To the point that if he could, he would exchange his salvation to give it to them. <clears throat> Verse 11 of that chapter says, For the children not yet being born, nor having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to the election might stand, not of works, but of him who calls. So he goes on to explain that, look, it's not, you, it's not you and everything that you do that makes you righteous. It is him who called you. And they, and they had forgotten about that. I, I, I guess we can, we can fall into that too, no? Where we start thinking that, that oh, you know, we're saved because I turn to Christ because I accepted Christ. I said yes to Christ. And it's, they, then we start, it's all about I, I, and me, and me, you know. And then we start looking at the lost almost with a, with borderline hate. 
I, I know I can be like that, where the same things that I used to do upset me and, and I, I can't stand those people because they do the same things, the same sins that I used to do. And then God reveals to me that, look, it's not about you. It is I who called you. And just when, just, be, just like I called you when you were in your sin and, and I reached out to you, I still loved you. That's how I want you to love them. I've been praying, telling God to give me his eyes and his heart for the people that are lost. For all people, not just the people that are lost, but for all people. And it, it reveals a lot of who I am without Christ. And if I don't ask him for that, then I'm very judgmental. Yeah, yeah we know that they're sinners and we know that they're lost. But, you know, they, 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 also, they also need Jesus, just like we needed Jesus. Just like we need Jesus, I should say. And if they do accept that gift, then they're no longer enemies. You know, and they're no longer, you know, are, you know they're no longer enemies of, of us or of Christ, but now they're brothers. You know, and, that, and, and that's, that's the beauty of it, right? Verse 16, he says, So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Again, reminding us that it's not, it's not about the, the, the guy that's doing it or the person that's doing it. It's the person who called him. And in, they, in this case, it's God. It's about God. Verses 30 through 33. What shall we say then? That Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained it. That is a righteousness that is by faith. But that Israel who pursued a law that would lead to righteousness does not succeed in reaching that law. Why? Because they did not pursue it by faith. But as, but as if it were based on works, they have stumbled over the stumbling stone as it is written, behold, I am laying in Zion a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So he, he starts explaining in this, in this where, you know, it is, they, they were doing it based on works and they were, and their heart was based on works and not by faith. Earlier in, in, in the earlier chapters, he explained about how Abraham, his, his, it wasn't, his righteousness wasn't accounted to him because he was circumcised, because his, his righteousness was accounted to him before he was circumcised. It was because of the faith that he had in God and the promise that God had, had made to him. And he, was, he, was, he believed not only the promise, but God who made the promise. So it was all by faith. And Paul made that connection very clearly, uh, very early in the chapters. Now, chapter 10, verse 19, he says, But I asked, did Israel not, not understand? First, Moses says, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation with a foolish nation. I will make you angry. So they knew. They knew that, that this was bound to happen. Chapter 11, verses 5 through 6. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. But, is, but if it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Other, otherwise, grace no, would no longer be grace. Chap, uh, verses 11 and 12. Did God's people stumble and fall beyond recovery? Of course not, he says. They were disobedient. So God made salvation available to the Gentiles, but he wanted his own people to become jealous and claim it for themselves. Now, if the Gentiles were enriched because of the people of Israel, because the people of Israel turned down God's offer of salvation, think how much greater a blessing the world will share when they finally accept it. You know, very clear, very, very clear and to the point that because of their rejection, we are saved. Now imagine when they accepted. And then to close off chapter 11, verses 25 through 36, he goes on to say, I want you to understand this mystery, dear brothers and sisters, so that you will not feel proud about yourselves. Some of the people of Israel have hard hearts, but this will last only until the full number of Gentiles comes to Christ. And so all Israel will be saved as the scriptures say. The one who rescues will come from Jerusalem, and he will turn Israel away from ungodliness. 
And this is my covenant with him, that I will take away their sins. Many of the people of Israel are now enemies of the good news. And this benefits you Gentiles. Yet they are still the people he loves because he chose their ancestors Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God. But when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Now they are all rebels, and God's mercy has come to you so that they too will share in God's mercy. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so that he could have mercy on everyone. Oh, how great are God's riches and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decisions and his ways. For who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. That was the New Living Translation. I, I, I mixed up a couple of the translations depending on, on how clear it was. But regardless, I think it made it very clear. And so now we move on to chapter 12. So God has done this for us. Whether Jew or Gentile, God has done this for us. In a nutshell, he has sent his son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. That we, those of us who believe, will be righteous in him. Not in, not in ourselves, but through Jesus. So then, hence the title of the message, I'm saved, now what? So is it just continue going about the way you've been living? No. Here's where after doctrine comes duty. This is the part where we, this is where we have to pay attention and say, okay, now I know what God has done for us. Now what do I do? And, and as it said, not to pay him back. It is a response to his love and his mercy and his faithfulness. When you grasp that, when you grasp what God has done for us, then it's <laughs> this right here, what Paul, the instructions out of the, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul gives us, it's, it's going to come natural. So let's begin. <clears throat> Chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. <clears throat> the word beseech is another word for urge, for plead, appeal, or beg. So this is not something to be taken lightly. Paul wanted to make sure that, the, that he got the message across, and he was begging the hearers and the readers of this letter. He was pleading to them. You know, like when you go before a judge and you plead your case, you don't just go and present your case. That's, that's usually what a, a lawyer does. But when you go and stand before the judge, you don't just present your case, you plead your case. You're begging. You're at the mercy of him. And so you're, you're begging, you're pleading, <clears throat> you're appealing. By the mercies of God, by what, the, the mercy that God has shown towards you, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. And this is interesting. Why bodies? Why is it that, that Paul specifically says that you present your bodies as, as a li living sacrifice? Well, a couple of things come to mind. One, we know that the, the, the body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The living God dwells in your body. And so if the living God dwells in your body, then it's only obvious that you present yourself as a living sacrifice to God. Another thing, when you accept Jesus Christ, you become part of the body of Christ, and now you become the hands and feet of Jesus. And through you, Jesus starts serving people. So what, what you do, 
whether it's here in the church or outside the church, with these hands and with these feet and with all your members of your body, now you're doing it as, un, as, as if unto the Lord. And so now Jesus is, is doing things through you to those around you. Another thing is that this, this body, as Paul was talking about in chapter 7, is a means, can, can be a means, of transport, uh, a means of transport to sin. In other words, how many times has this, these, these feet taken me to go do something that doesn't please God? Or how many times do these hands take me, whether it's through the internet or, or, or grabbing something, or how many times do these ears or do these eyes or this mouth do something that does not please God? So I thought, I thought it interesting that Paul was making it clear that, hey, your members, your body, sacrifice it to God. Now, he didn't say a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. In, back in chapter 6, verse 13, he says, Don't offer parts of your body to sin, to be used as weapons to do wrong. Instead, present yourselves to God as people who have been brought back to life from the dead and offer all the parts of your body to God to be used as weapons to do right. He goes on to say, living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. In Hebrews chapter 13, verses 15 and 16, he says, through him then, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God, that is, the fruit of lips that give thanks to his name. And do not neglect doing good and sharing, for with such sacrifice, sacrifices God is pleased. You see, it's not just about singing with your lips, but also doing good with your hands, with your feet. Those are the type of sacrifices that please God. I know that <clears throat> it's easy for us to, um, to sing, um, you know, to, to praise God with our lips. And I'm not knocking that, you know, I do it all the time. But it's not as easy to go and do something that God would want you to do with your hands and your feet, with the skills that He has given you. Take, for instance, um, this Saturday, um, we have a call where um, a family from here from Calvary Chapel is uh, moving. And so we have a call to the church. Those of you who can help, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock, you know, hands and feet. And you probably might say, well, who's Nacho and Paulina? I don't know them. Why should I go and help them? Well, Hey, it's not about who you know, you know, and how, how, how do you expect to get to know them? That's your, that's your opportunity right there to go and get to know them. But again, don't do it for them. Do it for God. You know, it, it's, it's amazing the things that can get done with the amount of people. That the, the more hands and feet, the faster it gets done. You might think, I don't, but I don't, you know, I love my Saturday mornings. I love to sleep in. I... I you know, I do my devotionals on Saturday morning. I can't dedicate three or four hours. I, I've seen that those moves go one hour, maybe two hour tops when there's a lot of people. So whatever it is that, that God lays upon your heart to do, those are the sacrifices and that, that please God is when you service, when you do service, when you serve others. When he said reasonable service, that, that kind of didn't click in my mind, so I had to look into it uh, through other uh, translations. Um, other translations say spiritual worship, true worship, and this brings to mind what Jesus said, those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. But another translation said intelligent worship. I thought that's interesting. Intelligent worship? It's, in other words, logical thing to do. So 
If this is the logical thing to do, why, why is it logical? Chapters 1 through 11. The mercies of God. What God has done for you, this is the logical thing. This is like, can I say, this is common sense. If, if, if that can be applied here, like, it's just the natural thing to do because of what God has done for you. And so now it makes sense. Okay, reasonable service. A living sacrifice. This living, this body offered up as a living sacrifice to God. And this is the logical thing to do because of what God has done for me. Interesting. Verse 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and ex what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The New Living Translation puts it like this. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. The Phillips translation puts it like this. Don't let the world around you squeeze you into its mold, but let God remold your minds from within. Thank God for those other translations because they put it in, in terms that I can understand. You know, it's like, okay, when I read those, it, it, it just clicks up here. I don't know, maybe I'm just a um, simple kind of guy, but I, sometimes I need that. I need that, you know, that explanation in my language. So it says, the renewing of the mind. How, how, how can we renew our mind? You know, in Ephesians, it talks about, in Ephesians 5, it talks about washing of water by the word. Do you know that? <clears throat> Our mind is so polluted. I don't know about you, but my mind before Christ, I, I just let anything enter it. And when I mean anything, I mean anything. And, and our mind is like a sponge. Whatever you put it in, that's what it's soaking up. So then when, the, when you go to squeeze it, that's what it's going to put out. So my mind was so polluted, my heart was so polluted, that whenever the squeeze of life came to it, nothing but pollution would come out of my mouth. Nothing but cursing. Junk. And so for us, the one, how, how do we cleanse that? How do we wash all that pollution out? Get into the Word of God. Get into the Word of God, reading the Word of God on a daily basis. Coming before God and asking Him to, to help you through that. Because I'll tell you what, if you think that after you're saved, there's no pollution that enters into your mind, you're wrong. Because just look around. Just, all you have to do is look around, walk out of your house and look around. And there's so much pollution out there that it's, it's hard to stay away from it. That's why it's important that we come back on a daily to the Word of God. We come before God on a daily and ask, us, ask Him to cleanse us of all that junk that, that we let in, whether it's intentionally or unintentional. <clears throat> John 17, the Lord said, Sanctify them by your truth. Your Word is truth. So the, the Word of God is not only what's going to wash our minds, but also set us apart. It's going to tell us how to act. It's going to tell us how to behave. And it's going to set us apart from the rest of the world. You see, if we don't get into the word, then we're not going to know what God ex expects from us. You see, if we don't read chapter 12 of Romans, if we just stick to chapter 8, which is a beautiful chapter, and it gives us encouragement, but if we just stick to chapter 8, in chapter 12 we're missing the duty we're missing what God expects from us. So it's very important that we go through the whole counsel of God, not just some sections, not just the New Testament, the Old Testament too. Another way that I found it um, to help me when I came to Christ was, um, so I grew up in a church uh, a, a, a Spanish-speaking church, and there was a hymnal that they used in Spanish. And to me, music 
was like my life. I, you know, I, I was, it was so ingrained in me that I could, I could rap the, the, the songs that were on the radio, you know, without, without missing a beat. Um, unfortunately, they were full of junk. And so all that was in my heart. And so I needed to flush all that out. And so I said, I know, I'm going to find that hymnal. So I, because those songs were still in there in my heart, but I didn't know the lyrics. I knew the, 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 the tone and I knew the, the, um, how they went, but I just didn't know the lyrics. And so I started looking and when I finally found it and I was able to recall all those memories and all that just started. And, and these were hymnals, you know, praising God. And, and so all that just started flushing out all the junk. It just started washing it all out, washing it out. So now throughout the day as I'm driving, you know, in the truck and I'm singing these hymns, you know, praise the Lord and glory, hallelujah and this and that. And it's no longer, you know, the junk that I used to. And, and that started helping me. Matt Boswell said, singing shapes our thinking. The more we sing truth, the more the truth shapes us. And I said, ain't that true? So what what are we singing? You know, what, what is it? What are we listening to and what are we singing? So, so if we stick to the songs that, that, that are talking about nothing but truth, nothing but exalting Christ, then that is going to start shaping our mind and our mind's going to be renewed over and over again to the truth. And then as we do that, then we're being conformed to the image of Jesus. So we're not being conformed to we're not being conformed to the world, but we're being transformed. <clears throat> verse, verse 3, For I say, through the gra grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. When he says grace given to me, I, I see Paul in a, in, in a very humble state. You see, he didn't say, you know, he didn't pull rank. He didn't say, I'm, I'm telling you this as an apostle of Jesus Christ. You know, he didn't pull out the seniority card or the pastoral card or, you know, the authority card. He reminded them, for I say through the grace given to me. You know, very humble. I think that's, that's a very real and, and, and a, a reminder that we all need in our lives. To stay humble. Galatians 6.3, the New Living Translation says, If you think you are too important to help someone, you are only fooling yourself. You are not that important. <laughs> I, th I thought that was cool, you know. It's like, man, you know, Paul spoke his mind, and, and he, I like that. I like the fact that Paul wrote it, you know, that, that he, you know, the Holy Spirit knew who was going to be reading these letters in the future. And I think a lot of times we need to remind ourselves, hey, you're not that important. Go help. I, that, that, that's convicting to me, because a lot of times I want to help the people that are close to me, but the ones that aren't close to me or the ones that I, they just don't rub me the right way. I don't want to help them. Well, God's like, no, you got to help them too. If they need help, you got to help them. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function. So we being many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another. And he goes on to talk about, so we're a body. We're the body of Christ. You know, you, some of us are hands, some of us are feet, some of us are mouth, nose, ears. But the body works in harmony. The body works together, all for one goal. And so if we're the body of Christ, then we ought to start acting with one another as members of the same body, servicing each other, serving each other. He goes, he goes on to say, Having then gifts 
differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophesy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. I think that's self-explanatory. I don't think I need to say any more than that. Basically, what, what gifts God has given you, use them. Use them. I don't know. I don't know what, what gift you have. But I'm, I, I, one thing is for sure. God has given you a gift. How do, how do you find out what gift you have? Start serving. If you're, ever, if you're here on Sundays and you hear the announcements, I think it's every Sunday they remind us that, they, that, that there's uh, opportunity to serve here at Calvary Chapel Yuma. You know, there's, I, I don't think there's ever been a problem where they have too many servants. On the contrary, I think that it's always like, you know, they're in need of servants. And so... Again, what gift do you have? I don't know. I didn't know what gift I had, but I started wherever I can help out. If it was car washes for the youth to um, whatever it was that I know I can do when, when there was next door and they, they were kind of remodeling over there. I, I don't know nothing about construction, but I sure can take uh, um, directions. Hold this, hand me that. You know, or, uh, you know, let's move this over there. You know, just simple instructions. I can follow those. I'm not a leader. As, as, you know, I'm not, I'm not supervisor material. I am more of a, like, tell me what to do and I'll get it done. But when, I, when, when I'm told, okay, you're, you're in charge or you're, you're, you're in charge of this install at work. Um, I don't know how to tell people how to do it. I know how to show them how to do it. So uh, one of my problems is, Instead of saying, hey, um, go and do this or go get that and bring it over here, it comes, uh, this is the way I tell people. If you like, go get that and bring it over here. Never, never realized what I was doing until one day I remember a young man. I told him just like that. If you like, go ahead and, and, and um, back up the truck over here to the dock. And then he goes, okay, well, I, I don't want to. And I was like, he like, okay, well, then I'll do it. He goes, well, you asked me if, if I wanted to do it. You asked me if I like, and no. And so that, that made me realize, like, okay, I, there's a different way I got to approach this. Um, but ju that's just the, the, the way I am. I, you know, I'll show you how to do it. Um, and then if you can pick up on it, then follow my lead. Um, so whatever gift you have, if you don't know, start serving. I guarantee you you'll find out real quick. Some of you have gifts that you don't even know. And you're, you're a natural at it. And, and when, you, when you start exercising those gifts, believe me, it, it, it'll even make you feel good because you're like, okay, I, you know, I am a part of the body. You, you feel like you, you, you're, you're useful instead of useless. You feel like, like you're contributing. Better it is to give than to receive, the Lord said, right? <clears throat> Now, here's where it gets personal for some of us. <laughs> it says in verse 9, Let love be without hypocrisy. The easy to read version says, Your love must be real. The New Living Translation puts it like this, Don't just pretend to love others, really love them. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love. In honor, giving preference to one another. The English Standard Version puts that verse like this. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. If there's going to be any arguing in the body of Christ, if there's going to be any... I don't know if even bickering is the right word. It's, no, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. You know, outdo each other in, in, in those types of things. You know, in showing honor to one another. I think that that, that that makes it pretty clear, you know. It's like you put everybody else before yourself. 
And, and when everybody thinks that way, then the problem is who's going to go first, right? <clears throat> Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. The New Living Translation says, never be lazy. I understand those words real clearly. I can be lazy. Never be lazy, but work hard and serve the Lord enthusiastically. Another version says, as you serve the Lord, work hard and don't be lazy. Be excited about serving Him. See, those are the type of words that I can understand. And it puts it in better perspective to me. Okay, so, because I can be lazy. I can drag my feet. I can be the type of person that, oh, really? Like, there's, there's, you know, I've been asked if I can help in one area here in the ministry or another. And I know I can. And I'm like, okay, then that means I have to be here. When, what if I wake up that morning and I don't feel like coming? That, that, that commitment. You know, it's like, man. <laughs> and then, you know, even, even just to men's Bible study, a lot of times, uh, you know, I'm like, I'm being lazy and I'm like, ah, you know what, I'm always there. I'll take this Friday off. And then for some reason, the Lord is just pressing it upon my heart to go. It's like, what are you doing? What are you going to do? Like, just go, just go. And there's been a lot of times when I end up coming, dra dragging my feet and I leave out of here like with a blessing that I did not expect. With a blessing that, that uh, you know, I received something or I was able to contribute something and I leave twinkle toes out of here. You know, just like, wow, that was awesome. You know, um, that's, that's, that's um, not expecting anything. Now imagine, and I know you've, you've done it. You come to church expecting the Lord to speak to you. And if you haven't, try it. Sunday, when, <laughs> when pastor's back, put it in your heart. And ask the Lord, speak to me. I'm going with an expectation, Lord, that you're going to speak to me. I want to hear from you. Whatever it is, don't, don't, don't put, Lord, this is what I want to hear this, this Sunday. Can you put it on the pastor's heart to preach about that? No. No, just come with an open heart and an open mind. God, I want to hear from you. And believe me, loud and clear. There's been many times when I'm sitting, listening, and it's, it, it's like, you know, is he listening to the conversations that are going on in, our, in my house? Or, you know, but see, I, I love this because a lot of times it's not even here. Um, a few months ago when I went to the Pastors and Leaders Conference, I was under, uh, I was going through a hard time in my life. Or, yeah, going through it, getting out of it, whatever you want to call it. Halfway there. I started uh, experiencing um, something with my eye and I wasn't supposed to be past a certain elevation and it was too late and I was in the van with pastor and a couple of other brothers and I'm like, okay, we're halfway to Tucson and if I tell him, I know that he's going to say, well, let's go back and I don't want to make him miss out on that. So within me, I just started praying, God, I know this is my fault, God, I should have done my homework and, and done my homework on what elevations are from here to Tucson. I accept, I accept whatever the outcome is, I accept it. You know what? We're halfway there. God, I'm going, and I'm going to receive the blessing that you have for me there. Whatever it is, God, I'm going. If I come back blind, then so be it. I, I won't fault you. It's not your fault, God. This is my fault, but I want to get that blessing over there. There was a total of six speakers, I believe, or, or more. I don't remember, but either way, Every single speaker God used to speak to me. And, not, and, and not, not only to me, but I was there. So my notes started changing from we must do this to I must do this. To started taking it very personal because I understood God was speaking to me because that's what I had asked him for. And God came through and I loved it. Came back with, like, with an energy, with a, with a, a, a fervent spirit ready to, to put these things into application. I knew what God had wanted me to do. I knew what he, wanted me to, what he wanted me to stop doing too. So they, I came back, all right, Lord, I'm ready. So again, what God can speak to you, it's 
just open up your heart, your ears, and let him speak. Receive it too. Verse, is that 12? Yeah, 12. Rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, continuing steadfastly in prayer. You know, the hope that lies within us ought to cause rejoice in us. We ought to be rejoicing. doesn't matter. Did you notice after saying rejoicing <clears throat> in hope, patient in tribulation? You know, when, when, when we're in the middle of that trial, of that storm in our life, it's almost like we just want to give up and throw in the towel. And, and sometimes we become bitter and angry people. We ought to look to our hope that is in Jesus Christ and allow that to be our joy. And, and let go of anything else. Tribulation will still be there. Just be patient through it. God will see you through it. He has before. You ever read the Bible? How many times God has seen people through, through storms and through trials and tribulations? Those are, those are there not, not just to keep a record account. They're there for us to go back, read on them, and remind ourselves that God is faithful and he will see us through it. Continuing steadfastly in prayer. Steadfastly, always praying, no matter the situation. If your prayer, if, if you don't know what to pray about, then let your prayer turn into worship. You know, just start, start praising the Lord. He goes on to say, distributing to the needs of the saints, given to hospitality. Again, talking about serving Serving your brothers and your sisters in the Lord. Verse 14. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. It's very easy for us to, to curse those that, that are mocking us. But we're called to bless them. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. This is talking about the unity within the body. We're, that we're so united that... When our brother is in, in, in rejoicing, then we rejoice with them. And if there's one that's weeping, that's, that's going through a hard time, then our heart aches because they're going through a hard time. Be of the same mind toward one another. Do not set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. The New Living Translation puts it like this. Live in harmony with each other. Don't be too, too proud to enjoy the company of ordinary people. And do not think you know it all. Another version says, live together in peace with each other. Don't be proud, but be willing to be friends with people who are not important to others. Don't think of yourself as smarter than everyone else. And then another version says, consider everyone as equal and don't think that you're better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. <laughs> I was like, okay, I, I understand that. Be humble. Verse 17, repay no one evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Now we know that that's impossible to live peaceably with all men. But if, it, if it's within you, in other words, hey, don't, don't, expect, don't expect it from the next man, from you. Li live in peace with all men. Don't be the one starting fights with your neighbors. You know, if your neighbor's dog came and did his business on your yard, it's, I know it's easy to grab the shovel and just chuck it over or, or, or put it in the back of his truck. No. It's just as easy to scoop it up and go take it to the, to the trash and don't say nothing. You know, if, if you're... I have palm trees, and my palm trees tend to fall on the neighbor's yard. 
I think what the Lord is telling me is that I need to do what I can to pull those palm trees over to my yard. Whatever it is, but we're not to be the cause of an argument or a fight. We need, if, you know, if it's within us, leave at, live at peace with men, with everybody. He goes on to say, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. It's very easy when people are, are, are evil towards us, when people mistreat us, to treat them the same way. I know it because I can fall in that. I can have people mistreat me, whether it's at the store or, or at work, you know, just going about my own business and I want to bite back but the Lord says no just turn the other cheek no just let it go and that's hard when you're trying it on your own but if you rely on the power of the Holy Spirit then none of this is hard if you remember what God has done for you then chapter 12 is not that hard and the following chapters because it goes on to talk about submitting to the authority and I know a lot of times that's very hard, whether it's the local authorities all the way to the national, depending on who's, who's uh, you know, in that position. A lot of times we want to rebel against them, and that's not what the Bible calls us to do. The Bible calls us to pray for them, whoever is in office, right? That's what we're called to do. So, again, all this that is, that, that, that is written in chapter 12 and forward we ought to remember what God has done for us. And what God has done for us will make it easy for us, if we dwell on that, if we're thankful for what God has done for us, to go ahead and live these values that, that, that through the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit gives us. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for, for your word. We thank you that you... Make it clear on what you expect from us, Father God. We thank you, first and foremost, for salvation and for sending your Son to die on that cross for our sins, something that we could never do. We couldn't repay the sins that we have committed. But I thank you, God, that you had a plan from the very beginning, that you didn't just leave us to ourselves, but you had a plan. And that plan is coming to fruition pretty soon. That you will come back for us. We eagerly await that, Lord. And while we're here, Lord, I pray that you continue to use us to serve one another, to love one another. And that, as you said, that by showing love to one another, that the world will know that we are yours. God, I pray that this message continue to resound in our hearts and in our minds as we leave this place. And I pray that if anybody here does not know you, God, that you reveal yourself to them. Open up their mind to who they are without you, apart from you. And reveal the gospel to them so that they may come to accept your gift of salvation through Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the the many souls that are here, Lord, at Calvary Chapel, Yuma, I pray that you continue to bless them and use them. That we may continue to grow in your grace and in your word, Lord. In Jesus' name.